Okay, I think we can uh, we can start back. If there's any question, yeah, please interrupt anytime. Okay, let me make sure the recordings are going. Yeah. Okay. So basically, what what we saw, or you know, together with the challenges, what what we have is it's basically the triangle inequality for the spectral line. It already says something interesting, right? Because you can already get from here some form of stability, right? Because if Y is a very small matrix in the sense of spectral spectral norm, or you know, all these like singular values are very, very small, then right, this means that the singular values of X plus Y will be will be very close to the to the to the largest singular value of X plus Y will be very close to the one of X. Right? And if you want the inequality on the other side, just do it with x plus y and minus y, right? And you would get the, the, the inequality on the other side. Right? But I mean, this is what triangle inequality gives you when norms need to satisfy, of course. But if something is very small, then if you have another object, uh, when, you, when you subtract by that, uh, you're very close to the original object. Okay, so, uh, so let's see. Or your norm is very close to that object. Uh, okay, so so now uh, there's no questions, and I'll, I'll continue. So now th there is a natural there is a natural generalization of these two matrix norms. Okay, so there's a natural right natural generalization. Okay. Of these norms. Right, and this is known as the Shatten P norm. Okay, so I'll, I'll definition of Shatten P norm. Okay, and given a matrix again, right, this has been our object all around, n by m, the Shatten P norm is the following. Okay, so I'll use the notation SP. Okay, the Shatten P norm is equal to basically the LP norm of the singular values. One and to the minimum because it's so many there are. To the power p, right? To the one over p, right? Another way of writing this is just this is the p norm of the LP norm of the vector of singular values. Okay, where for you know the Shatten S infinity norm is just the L infinity norm of the singular values, which so is the biggest one. Right, so it's just sigma one of x. This is exactly what we call the spectral norm, which is usually where we don't use any subscript. And the Shatten S2 norm is just the Frobenius norm. Okay, and these two are the most common ones, but I mean you can speak of them in generality in this in the Shannon P norms. In particular, turns out that uh, you know, just as a side note, turns out that the the, the Shatten one norm is important is important for matrix completion and recommendation systems. And we'll, we'll talk a bit about it. Okay, okay. so so now, uh, you know, proving, so another, another, you know, challenge I left in the lecture notes is proving that this is actually a norm. This is a little trickier for P, equals to an infinity is rather easy. For others, this is a little trickier, just like proving that the LP norm is actually a norm, but you know, it's, it's a good exercise nonetheless. Okay, so now we've set up the, the definitions of distances and norms that we need to, to do the, what, what follows. And now there's the other idea that I sort of already, already leaked a bit, but, uh, you know, right? but there's another idea, which is a good way of approximating matrix X by a rank R matrix is to take is to take okay I'll use here I'll be more precise but I'll say take X take the SVD okay maybe I should use consider to zero out 
the all but the first k the first r sorry singular values of x in the SVD of x. Okay, and this is what we did with uh, with the squirrel picture. It turns out that this can, we're going to show mathematically that this is always a good idea. Okay, so what what do I let's let's be now more mathematical. Okay, so we have again our object x is n by n. Right, we define we define x r. Right, we call this the truncated SVD. Right, I mean, truncated SVD is more the name of the algorithm, not of the output of the algorithm, but I'll refer to it in abusive notation as the truncated SVD. And you compute it the following. Right, so XR is UR, sigma using R, and VR, okay, where UR is an object n by r is the first okay i should have maybe here x so all throughout this is the notation i'm using but maybe i should write it still first e, first r columns of u right v r and m by r is the first r columns of v and sigma r is right, which is now an R by R matrix, is a diagonal matrix with you know sigma one x all the way to sigma R x. Okay, when when the matrix X is rank R, this is this is equal, but otherwise this this might not be, of course. Okay. And so the the you know the statement that I written is in green is that X R is a good approximation. To X, or is oftentimes. Okay. So a few. St let's just make a few observations about this object, right? So it's it's the object clear. You compute the SVD. You zero out the singular values that are big, you know, the singular values after the, the rth one. And then because you zeroed out the singular values, you get to delete turns, tons of uh, rows and columns, uh, the turns of columns of U and V. Okay, I forgot to transpose. Yeah, okay. So, okay, a few observations, sort of clear observations, but it's good to make them anyway. So rank of X R is of course R, right? Because of how we did it. Okay, I mean, it could be smaller than R if X itself had rank smaller than R. But uh, yeah, we should assume, you know, rank of X is bigger or equal than R. Otherwise, uh, you know, it doesn't make much sense. All right, another, another simple observation, but, but worth making, is that the largest singular value of X minus XR is, of course, the Rth plus one singular value of X. All right, just think about what happened in the decomposition. If you subtract x by xr, if you look at the SVD decomposition, it's basically going to be zeros in the first, uh, you know, if you keep the order of the singular value decomposition, the order of the singular values of x, what you're going to have is zeros on the first r elements, diagonal elements of sigma, and then you're going to show up sigma r plus one and so on and so forth. When you order them to be in decreasing order, of course, this is the biggest one. Okay, if this is not clear, try to prove it, work it out. Okay. So this is already saying, telling us something, right? It's telling us that in this picture here, right? In this picture here, that if I take, right? If I take XR, right? In, in this picture, exactly. If I take X and XR, then the, the operator norm of the difference is the value of the, of the singular value here. So the smallest this is, the smaller is the residue or the error in operator norm at least. Okay, so now comes the, the interesting mathematical theorem. Okay, and, 
and the mathematical theorem is that, right? So I'll first state it not so mathematically, and then we'll state an actual theorem. Is XR is in a, in a general sense that I'll, I'll specify later. The best rank R approximation approximation of X. Okay, so this is the main theorem for today. Okay, and this is known as the eckhart young mirsky theorem. Okay. So we'll do it first for the spectral norm. Okay, so I'm actually I'm going to call it a lemma, even though it's because it's just a particular case of a theorem and it will be used to prove the more general case. Okay, so this is the, the eckhart young mirsky theorem for spectral norm okay, is that XR is the best uh, low rank approximation in spectral norm. Okay, so truncated SVD gives best low rank approximation in spectral norm justifies what we did at least if you know justifies what we did with squirrel in a way but it's not com it's not obvious at all that uh, right that the thing the thing that our eyes uh, see as in a picture being good or not has anything to do with this with the operator norm of the difference between the two images but if it does it justifies that so let's write that in you know more mathematical ways so right in particular let okay so now i'll write the actual theorem so let x be uh, it's just you know a way of mathematically write the, the sentence in between parentheses, right? And R uh, smaller than minimum between n and m, right? Right. Let x x is defined above, R is defined above. Right for any. Rank R matrix uh, B, right? Also in, in M, we have the following inequality that the approximation that B provides to X is worse than the one that's given by XR. Okay, this is the theorem. Okay, maybe I should have done this with other color. I'll maybe put it uh, in, inside the bubble, right? Because this was the, was the statement in words, and uh, below is the statement yeah, in mathematical terms. Okay. Okay. It's clear how this, right? Any any matrix that's rank R B, the distance to X is bigger than if we take the truncated SVD. Right? The truncated SVD is the way to get the closest. Okay, so let's let's prove this. Okay, so proof. Okay, so let you know x again. So it's always the same thing, right? We take the the, the SVD, be the SVD of x. Okay, now. Okay. Since rank of B is equal to R, okay, then there must exist, okay, let's say, there must exist a vector W different than zero, not zero, right, in the span of V1 through VK plus one, VR, sorry. Okay, so I take the, these are the singular vectors of X, right? So I take the first K plus one singular vectors of X. They're also orthonormal vectors. So they span a K plus one dimensional subspace. Okay, because the rank of B is R, an R plus one dimensional subspace, sorry. 
because the rank of B is R, there must be a vector that's in the span of these such that it's in the kernel of B. Okay, right? The kernel of B is of dimension uh, M minus R because I have a subspace here of dimension R plus one, uh, they, they, must, uh, right, they must intersect. Okay, without loss of generality, I can take the norm of W to be one, right? Because if W satisfies this, I can make it bigger or smaller. There's no absolutely no problem with that. Okay, if any of these steps are not obvious, I mean, feel free to interrupt, but it's also good to, you know, try then after after the lecture to see if, if some of these things are not completely obvious why they're true. And it's a very good practice to get a bit more practice in linear algebra to just try to do these things yourself. Okay, but here's just, you know, you look at the dimension of the, of the kernel, you look at the dimension of this subspace, and they, they must intersect. Okay, so now let us write, okay, so let us write W. In the in the in the coefficients of, uh, of v, so so let's write let's write w equals sum. We say k from one to r plus one. Okay. Um, alpha k v k. Okay. okay, a few things because you know the v's v one through v k plus one. They are orthonormal, right? Because they they correspond to the to the first k plus one singular vectors of x, so they're orthonormal vectors. Right? Are right? They are orthogonal to each other, and they have uh, they have norm one, right? Then then basically we have a few things. One is that of course the alpha k's are just the inner products between uh, v k and w. It's one thing. Another thing is the fact that the norm, right, the norm of W squared, so, okay, I can write it this way, the sum of the alpha K squared from K from one to R plus one, oh, I keep replacing, sorry, I keep, this is R, of course, sorry, I sometimes mix R with K, I think it's all okay, K is my dummy parameter, R is the, the top of the summons, okay, let me try not to say space and do it a bit, open so we have this and k from 1 to r plus 1 of k square is of course equal to the norm of w squared which is 1 okay so right because you know since these are an orthonormal basis for their spin then of course the coefficients of, of W are just given by the inner product and the norm of the coefficients is the same thing as the norm of the vector. Okay, so in particular, this, this is speaker code zero. Okay, so now, now we're there basically. Why? Because, okay, now, now we're basically done. So let's just finish. Okay, the norm of X minus B. Right, remember this is the max over all possible vectors V such that the norm of v, such that the norm of v is one of right x minus b v, right? This is just the definition of the norm. But so for sure, this is big or equal than any particular choice, right? Because it's the maximum of all possible choices. So I'm going to choose w. It's big or equal than x minus b w, right? That w is above. Okay, but w is in the kernel of v, so the term with b disappears, and I just have x, w. Okay, we're almost there. But now what is this? I mean, this is just, right, the L2 norm. This is like the L2 norm as in, as in vectors of u sigma v transpose w. Right? But then, of course, you know, the u is not doing anything. If you think of the, the vector, the the L2 norm of a vector, say, y, is just y transpose times y, right? When you take that, clearly, this u is going to disappear, right? Because it's going to show up u transpose u, and we know that that's identity, right? 
And so I can cancel that U out. I mean, another way to say this is if I have an orthogonal matrix and I rotate a vector, I don't change its size, right? So it's okay to take the U out. Okay, there's a, I mean, as, as usual in linear algebra, there's many different ways of seeing the same thing. Okay, but what is this now? Now we know exactly what this is because, right, we have the, you know, these are just the inner products. This vector is just a vector of the alphas. Right, alpha one all the way to alpha. Uh, right, so I have, I mean, all the way to alpha uh, m or the minimum between. Okay, so I, I, it depends if m is. I don't want to write a lot, but this is just alpha one, alpha two, and so on. Right, and at some point it becomes zero. Right, because this is just the inner product between the columns of v and w. Yeah, I'm gonna make sure that I'm not going either too fast or too slow, but uh, okay, let me, maybe maybe I should make this a bit more clear, right? This is V1 transpose, V2 transpose, and so on times W. So you get exactly, right, V1 transpose W, V2 transpose W, all the way to the end. But you know, we know that only the first, uh, right? We know that only the first R minus one are, uh, are non-zero. Okay, so this is, okay, I'll try to keep the side notes inside an, a different bubble. Okay, this is a side note. So then what is this equal to? Well, and then, right, we get these vectors, then the sigma multiplies by the singular values. So this is a vector whose, right, this is, the, this is a vector whose entries are uh, first singular value of x times alpha one, second singular value of x times alpha two, and so on. So what is this L2 norm is equal to the sum and from, from k from one to r plus one, because all the other terms disappear, of sigma k squared x times alpha k squared. Right, right? because sigma is, is diagonal. Okay, so now, now let's look at this sum. So I know that the sum of the alpha k's is one. So I'm effectively taking an average, right? This is effectively a weighted average, right? Weighted, oh, sorry, right? This is a weighted average of the, of, of right? Of sigma one squared of x all the way to sigma r plus one squared of x, right? Where the weights are the alpha k squared. Okay, so in particular, this needs to be bigger or equal than, you know, the smallest of the sigmas, right? And the smallest one is the r plus one. So this is smaller or equal than, right, sigma r plus one x squared, right? Which is just, right, because they're positive. And this is exactly the spectral norm of x minus x r minus one. Uh, r, sorry. Right? Maybe it helps to have another, right? This is the sigma one of x minus x r. Okay, and so this is uh, right, QED. Right, for any any rank k, any rank r matrix B, the difference between x and b is bigger or equal than the difference between x and x minus r. Okay, and this is the proof. Okay, and it's, you know, again, really nice uh, example of using, you know, SVD and making, uh, uh, doing, uh, you know, operations and manipulations with SVD, which is extremely useful. Okay, so now the goal is to prove, so the, what, where we're going is we're gonna prove this by the end of today for any Shadden P norm, not just for the spectral norm. In particular, I would argue that, you know, if you think about the squirrel picture, probably thinking about like you take the, you know, the perturbed, the compressed squirrel minus the normal squirrel, it will give you something. Thinking that what our eyes see is the operator norm of this as a matrix is maybe a bit difficult to swallow, I think. But seeing that what our eyes see has something to do with the sum of the squares of the, the difference between intensities may be a bit easier. Right, so it'd be more natural to try to prove this for the Frobenius norm. Uh, and so we're gonna actually do it for any, any Shannon P norm. Okay. So before we go to proving the actual, uh, you know, the general eckert young mirsky theorem, we need to, to establish something known, the known as the vial inequalities for singular values. 
Okay, so we need another theorem. Right, this is the vial. Uh, so this is named after Vermin Vial, who spent uh, was a brilliant mathematician who spent a significant portion of his career at the Ha. Actually, there's a room named after him in, in HG in the G floor. Uh, actually, even has a statue of him in the room for singular values. Okay, and it says the following. It's it's a so this is more famous. This inequality is more famous for eigenvalues, and of course the one for eigenvalues you can you can from that one you can uh, you can uh, deduce the one for singular values just by realizing that singular values are the square root of the eigenvalues of the Gram matrix. But actually, for singular values, it's quite e quite easy to prove, and so I'll do that. It's it's a perturbative inequality on on eigenvalues, right? It, it relates the eigenvalues of the sums of two matrices with the sums of the eigenvalues of the, of said matrices, very much like like the inequality that that you saw when we this one in the blue in the blue uh, um, rectangle, right? Where it's relating the, the singular values of the sum with the sum of the singular values, but this one in a more much more general setting, and it says the following. So for all, okay, I'll write first inequality. So X and Y are matrices, then sigma I plus J minus one of X plus Y is smaller or equal than sigma I of X plus sigma J of Y. Basically for all I's and J's for which this, all, this makes sense, right? For all i j of course they need to be bigger or equal than one smaller or equal than the min between n and m and uh, i plus j minus one also needs to be smaller or equal than the min between n and m right where x and y are of course n by n okay so comment on side comment for i and j equals to one this is already what you saw right sigma one x plus y Smaller or equal than sigma one x plus sigma, uh, sorry, sigma one y. And in general, tells us more about about singular value. And these are very very important inequalities. They also hold for eigenvalues. Okay, so let's prove this. Okay, so this will follow. Actually, interestingly enough, we'll f I'll use what I just proved about uh, about. Uh, this, the, the eckerd young mirsky theorem for the spectral norm. Okay, so, so here's the idea of the proof. And, and we'll also show you how, uh, yeah, you know, even low rank, low rank approximations can even help you prove interesting uh, theorems in math that appear for now at least have nothing to do with low rank approximations. Okay, so let, uh, you know, X and Y are my objects and let X I minus one and Y J minus one, right there, they're the, they're the truncated SVDs. Okay, so I'll just write that. Truncated, truncated SVDs for X and Y. Of course, of, of rank I minus one and J minus one. Okay, so now the idea is uh, yeah, it's very simple, and it's just we're going to use uh, the, the the triangle inequality on the first uh, on the first singular value. So by triangular inequality. on sigma one, okay, uh, right, what I mean by this is sigma one of x plus y, small or equal than sigma one x, plus sigma one y, right, which was, you can prove, I mean, of course, when I ask in the challenge to prove this, I don't mean to use the vial inequalities to prove it, you should prove it in another way, but it's, it's easy to prove, okay? Then what do we have? We have that sigma one of, right, x minus x i minus one, plus y minus y j minus one is smaller or equal than sigma one of x minus x i minus one. I think you're already seeing where I'm going. Okay. Okay, so what is this? This is equal to, right? This is exactly now sigma i of x Right, this we saw before, plus sigma j of y. So I already have on the right-hand side what I want, right? I already have the right-hand side that I want. I just need to make the left-hand side show up. 
mean, but how, how do I make the left hand side show up now? Right, there's a nice trick. Okay, let's see what, what the left hand side is. Right, so let's call this left hand side. Okay, so what is the left hand side? The left hand side is equal to you know sigma one of x plus y minus x i minus one plus doing exactly the same thing. Right? But what we want, we don't want this, right? What we want on the left-hand side is we want that i plus j minus 1 singular value of x plus y. Right? But we're almost there, right? If this, if this here instead was the, the rank of this is at most, you know, i plus j minus 2. Right, the rank of this matrix is smaller or equal than i plus j minus two. Right, because the rank of the first one is smaller or equal than m minus one, the rank of the second is smaller or equal than j minus one, and the rank is subadditive. If this was indeed the best i plus j minus two uh, uh, low decom um, approximation rank i plus j minus two approximation to x plus y, then this would be exactly the 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 i plus j minus one singular value of x plus y. It's not necessarily, but because right right by Eckhart Young Mirsky for spectral norm, we know that this is big or equal than if indeed we had taken the truncated SPD for the sum. Right, this is what we proved when we proved the uh, Eckhart Young uh, Mirsky for, uh, for spectral norms. But what is this? This is exactly what we want, right? This is exactly I plus J minus one. And so, you know, so it does. Okay, so now we're ready for our main theorem. We have 10 minutes, which is about how long I need. So maybe before, before saying, for stating and, and proving the main theorem of today. I just want to say that there's another proof of these inequalities, very simple one, based on the quorum fisher variational principle for singular values. You know, so you probably remember from, um, from linear algebra, the quorum fisher uh, you know, the variational principle for, for, eigen, for eigenvalues, there's such a thing also for singular values. Again, you know, the connection is clear if you take the eigenvalues of the quorum matrix. And via the, the variational principle is actually quite easy to prove these, these inequalities. Right here, I, I did it without the variational principle, but uh, I left it as a challenge on the lecture notes. I wrote the variational principle. I left it as an exercise to prove this with, via that. Again, the variational principle is also, also very useful. I'm assuming you've seen this in, in, uh, in linear algebra. Okay, so now the main theorem of today. Okay, so today, okay, so theorem. Okay, this is known. This is really the Eckhart uh, Young Mirsky. Theorem. Okay. Again, in words. Okay. I'll, I'll first say in words, and then I'll write in, in math terms. Uh, the, the truncated SVD. It's the best. Low rank approximation. In any uh, Shatton P. Okay, 
Okay, so now let's write in mathematical terms. Okay, let x be a matrix and r smaller than minimum of n and m. Okay, and p uh, bigger or equal than one, more or equal than infinity. Right. This is also true for the infinity norm, which is just the, the Shannon infinity norm is just operator norm. We've already proved it. Okay, let XR is defined above. Okay. And X minus B, Shannon P norm, is bigger or equal than X minus XR, Shannon P norm, for any B of rank. That's a beautiful theorem. Being, uh, you know, really giving us confidence that when we zero out singular values, it's a, it's a reasonable thing to do. You know, think about how it's not obvious that the best approximation in so many different norms is the same. It's a very special situation. Right? If you try to imagine projecting things or, or yeah, projecting things in um, you know, and even like Euclidean space, it's not always the case that different norms, the projection is the same, right? Try, try to work out a few examples and you'll see that this is not always the case that these kinds of things happen. Okay, so proof. Okay, so now now we've set up, we've done so much setup that this this will be uh, rather, rather easy. Okay, so first observation we have already done. Uh, we have already... We have already done p equals infinity, so we can focus on uh, so we can focus on p. Right? Let's focus p smaller than infinity bigger equal than one. Okay, so let let b right again. Let b be rank be rank k r. What is the idea? The idea is to use so idea is to use files inequalities with with x minus b and b. Oh, uh, sorry, with x minus b and b. Okay, so what does this give us? In particular, right, what do they give us? The, the vial, vial inequalities. Vial inequalities, they give that sigma i plus j minus 1 of the sum, right, of x minus b plus b, which means x. Right? Is smaller or equal than the ith singular value of x minus b plus the j's singular value of b. Okay. Why am I going already in the right direction? Right. Remember, what I want to prove is that the norm, right, the norm of uh, of x minus b is bigger or equal than the norm of x minus xr. Right, and so I already have something of some some sigma some singular value of x minus b being big or equal than something about x. Right, so I'm sort of I already have at least x minus b showing up on this on the right side of the of the inequality. Okay, now what's the idea? The idea is because right is to take j equals to r plus one. Right, because b is rank r. Sigma r plus one of b is equal to zero, right? B only has r non-zero singular values, no more. Okay, and so if we do that, we have in particular that right for all. Maybe we should now keep track of the i's, right? For all i bigger than one, right? For which, you know, i plus r plus one. Uh, minus one, right? I plus J minus one is smaller or equal than the minimum between N and M, right? We have that, we have 
that sigma of i plus r plus 1 minus 1, right? This is just r. So i plus r of x is smaller or equal than sigma i of x minus b, right? Plus sigma of r plus 1 of b. But we know that this is 0. Okay, and now basically we have we have all we want, right? Because we have the upper bound on the on the singular values, right? The upper bound on the singular values of sig a lower bound on the singular values of x minus v in terms of the singular values shifted by r of x, but these are exactly the singular values of x minus xr because we remove the first r ones. So basically we're done. We just have to collect terms. Basically, no no more ideas, right? Now it's just just labor, just have to collect terms, right? Uh, Shannon P norm to the power P, right? What is this? Is, uh, right, I mean, I, I try when I, yeah, when I'm doing this, because it's not always clear from if you're, like when you're following an argument, which part has an idea and which part is just, you know, labor of keeping track of and collecting terms and so on, and the ideas are now, are now over. Sigma k to the p of x minus b. Right. And now I'm even going to write this. I'm just, right, because I'm going to shift these by, uh, right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shift later from, I'm going to go from here to ones that are shifted by k plus r. So I want this sum to go only to minimum of n minus m minus r. But of course, I can make the sum go to, to a, like some less of them. Right, because they're take, they're positive, they're taking to a power p. The sum can only be smaller. Right. Okay, but now, right, because of you know because of the inequality above try to keep it a bit in the screen, right? Because of this inequality, oh, it's all right there. Okay, because of this inequality here, right? And these are bigger or equal than, uh, it's bigger or equal than k from one, again, to the same thing, right? The point like for each sum, and this is true where I'm writing, or of sigma k plus r, Right, I'm just doing this for k, the p of x. Right, but I can just now, uh, you know, change change of variables on k. Right, and what is this? This is just the same exact same thing as k from going from r plus one. Just, just change of variables. Maybe I should use the letter L just to make this clear, right? But it's just I'm just changing the doing a change of variables, sigma. Um, right, but what is this? This is just you know this is just the Shannon P norm, right? This is just what's left of the singular values of x minus xr. the power p, right? Because it's just the rest of the, when I take the singular values, when I take xr, I'm effectively zeroing out, right? In xr, I zero out the singular values bigger than r. So when I take x minus xr, what's happening on the decomposition is I'm effectively zeroing out the first, the first uh, r singular values. And so when I take the LP norm to the power p of the rest, I'm getting exactly the shut and p norm. And so this proves our theorem. Okay. Somehow, right on perfect timing, because it's exactly six now. Yeah, I think it's the first time that I finished uh, exactly what I wanted to say exactly on time. So yeah, I'm happy to take uh, take any questions.